Barrett, I'm the Artistic Director of the National Youth Jazz Collective. Welcome to this week's hashtag National Youth Jazz Wednesday. Um, and we've been working our socks off for everybody. It's our last week. We break up tomorrow. We're going to be on holiday for two weeks. First time we've ever taken a, an Easter holiday, because usually we'll be going around the country on tour for the auditions. Um, and my partner in crime, come and join me, uh, Nick. Come and tell us all about what you've been up to, because you've been working your socks off today, getting the newsletter and the website. Give us a bit of a snapshot of what you've achieved today. Absolutely. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Hashtag National Youth Jazz Wednesday. Uh, it's great to great to see, see you and be back on our usual Wednesday slot. And I think, yeah, it has been a mental week and we've got so, so much done. Um, there's a beautiful newsletter which will be going out tomorrow, uh, put together by our amazing uh, Nadja at NADWorks. Big round of applause for Nadja at NADWorks. And yeah, we're we're looking at the audition tour as well, rescheduling the final things uh, for for that and getting the, the big dates in the diary. We've had business plan, which Izzy has worked around the clock for, I think is safe to say. Yeah, uh, to, cancel, yeah. To get to might, the, might you share some of the newsletters, just maybe the three headlines, the new bits about the calendar, about the what NYJC means for you. And I think there was something else that you also put together because it's a whole new area of the newsletter. Yes, absolutely. So I think best way to do that is, is just a little screen share. That'd be good. Onto here. And we have dates for your diary, which is a new section, uh, a segment of the newsletter. Um, so this is this is a place where you can subscribe to our calendar and keep up to date with uh, all things NYJC, as well as the newsletter being a place for that. Um, what NYJC means to me, which is our brand new campaign which we're asking you to help us tell your story of NYJC um, by recording a quick 60 second uh, video, letting us know what NYJC means to you. So you can click uh, the link through there and, and upload a little video to us through Dropbox. It's, it, all the details are explained there. And then a little bit about Ribble Valley Jazz and Blues Festival and the two uh, uh, workshops and masterclasses NYJC will be hosting on Saturday the 1st of May and Sunday the 2nd of May. Um, more information is in the newsletter as well so if you're not yet subscribed to the newsletter tonight is your night to do it because if you subscribe tonight you get it tomorrow uh, so to sign up it's nationalyouthjazz.co.uk forward slash sign up i think also in there there's a beautiful feature about our guest as well isn't there where you put um, a nice photo in a bit about our wonderful new guest who will be welcoming to the stage shortly so, and if you don't get the newsletter, you can go to the website and the campaigns are up there as well, aren't they? So like the will the diary be there as well? The diary will be there as well. That's Fantastic. that's on our new brand new events page, which is new today. And before we move on to introduce our new guest, the bit that I'm very excited about, that newsletter is unbelievable. I didn't know anything about it, by the way, everybody, until just at five o'clock, Nick said, come and see the news letter and he and Nadia have worked their socks off so I knew what we wanted to share but I didn't know about this new structure it looks great and then in amongst it all there is the that we're recruiting might you show us the general manager link so we're actually appointing we've got a brand new position part-time two days a week general manager to come and work with myself and Nick and we're both really excited about the addition to our team aren't we Nick can't wait yeah, absolutely can't uh, wait. due to start in um in June and so there it is, more details if you want to. We are hiring, and that's a, a new page, isn't it? So we're going to keep that for other things as well. So Nadia is, while we're doing this, working behind the scenes, loading all the, uh, the information about it all as well. So that'll be on the website. So pass it on, pass it on, pass it on, everybody that we're recruiting. Uh, interviews are going to be in May. Deadline is the last Tuesday of April. Interviews are going to be first two weeks of May starting middle of June. Oh my goodness, that would be so great, so great. Another thing that's so great is that we've spent the last few weeks working with our guests. We've done some pre-recorded videos and sort of putting together a quiz. So I'd like you, if you would please, Nick, to welcome our guest uh, so that we can have a wonderful conversation. Fantastic. So this evening, I think he needs no introduction for the life and the amazing things that he's achieved in that. So please welcome uh, Peter Ind. Yay! Hello, Pete. Come and join. I can't wait for this conversation. I've been, I've been waiting my whole life actually to sit down and talk to Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Great to see you. Welcome, welcome. I would say welcome to NYJC, but we've had the great pleasure of spending a few visits 
So uh, welcome back to NYJC. It's really great to see you. And hello, Sue, as well. Oh, can't hear you. Are you on mute, maybe? Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think of the show so far? <laughs> <laughs> fast <laughs> yeah well yeah and that's the nature of the music sometimes isn't it pete it's been a real pleasure talking to you over the last few weeks and we've had great fun putting a video together that we're going to share in a little while as well as looking back at a video you made called uh, jazz on a shoestring when did you make that film roughly it must have been about 1996 it was it was after the club as, as the club was going down i think Brilliant. And I remember that club with such fondness. So again, to have have the opportunity to talk to you, because as I was saying before, it's a really formative period for me, late 80s and into the early 90s. And wow. even though we didn't get to talk very much in person, because I was quite shy then, believe it or not, everybody, but I was there <laughs> for the music and I absolutely loved it. And I was just absorbing so much without anyone ever talking to me about it. I listened and listened and everyone at your club played their hearts out. So that's part of the story of why I am where I am today. So thank you for that, Pete. Really. <laughs> Big thank you. <laughs> so I know that you both came up with a wonderful idea during the course of this hour that we're going to sort of pepper a few questions of a quiz that you've put together. And I was wondering, Sue and Pete, whether you might explain what the quiz is about and also if you'd like to share. You very kindly donated some prizes as well. So can we hand over to you and hear about your idea? Yeah, do, do you want me to? Shoot? Peter's not that familiar with Zoom, so it's so he he said he'd asked me to to put them up. I mean, the quiz. We, what we thought is is that, that that we'd ask them some key questions about your your life, really, wasn't it? You know, the different aspects of your life. Be interesting to know uh, how much they know about him. So that that would be interesting. And what we we said is, uh, I think you, you're going to ask them to send in yeah. their, 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 their replies and that there will be some prizes afterwards. So shall I hold up the prizes, Peter? Yeah. So there's going to be, have I got it right? Okay. There, there, there's going to be a little bit back. Yeah, great. Lovely. That's See perfect. That. There's a Kenny Barron album. Wow. <laughs> there is a a Time for Improvisation album. Can you see that? Great, we get we get to hear about that in the conversation. Yeah, and then the th the third one, can you see that? I think it's that's it there. That's, that's it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The third one's Peter with Martin Taylor. Fantastic. Um, and they, they, you did you did his first two albums, didn't you? That that was one of the first oh. two uh, recordings that that Martin ever made, and I'm he was very ask, young. I'm going to ask Martin to come and join us in June to do one of the sessions. Oh, lovely. Really important to talk to Martin, don't you think, Pete? He's such an important person, um, Martin Taylor. Such an influence on the scene. I thought it was great to know that you were in on his first two albums. So you were passing it on. That's amazing. <laughs> you, you were really. But we went back, we went back up there about, about two years ago. Uh, two, three years ago, and he and Peter recorded some things, which I suspect is going to be one of your last albums coming out, really, isn't it? We, we, we've never got together to to uh, uh, put it together as a CD, but the, they did some recording when we were up there. So Was that during the time when you were talking to Martin? Because there's a lovely yes. series of 10-minute videos from a conversation with guitar. It's so... Yeah, it was, wasn't it? Yeah. I yeah. strongly recommend those. We couldn't include those today because it, we've got two lovely 20 minute videos. But if you want for everyone that's watching, definitely go on YouTube and find these conversations. They're beautiful. Oh, uh, that, that, that was. We've got a few more, few more prizes, yeah. should we say? This is so generous. Uh, oh, God. Have we got that together so you can see? Yes. Yeah. That's the book Peter wrote about Lenny Tristano. And, and I know you'll talk about oh, that in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. And we've got, then we've got some vinyls. Do kids these days watch vinyls? Yeah, listen to, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they watch them go round. <laughs> I was actually thinking going round. So there's one of Peter's first albums called Looking Out. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, and there's a, 
a second album, isn't there, Pete? Well, there's a couple of those. And then there's an album of th this one he loves. Can you back see that? Bit, back a little bit. Back. That's it. Lovely. There. With a guy called Sal Mosca um, that Peter's particularly fond of. So, yeah, and, and, a, and a, a couple more of the looking, uh, and another two of the Looking Out album. So there's a variety of prizes there. Also, I think it's really important for everyone that's watching, if you're not familiar with Peter's work, Looking Out is a really important album because it's got some fantastic approaches to creativity with the, uh, the different tracks. You get a lovely, fantastic insight into Peter's creative thinking. So I can't sell that album enough. It is <sighs> such an, it's a seminal album. It's a really important album in the, the story of jazz and the way things have developed. Mm. So thank you for, again for that, Peter, as well. <laughs> <laughs> Wondering whether we might, before we go to the video, which we're going to watch, which is, there's a brilliant video, I think you said you made it in the early 90s, called Jazz on a Shoestring. And it's an hour, an hour long. And what I did was we've edited it down for 20 to 20 minutes. You can go onto YouTube and watch the whole hour. Um, and I've particularly taken sections out about New York and some of the advice that you're giving to yourself and to other musicians, because I think the, the viewers will really benefit from that. But before we kick off, wondered, Sue, whether you might choose the, th or the three questions, or I don't know if the email came through. If, if it didn't, I can do the first three. Can you do the first three? Yeah, and then maybe in the while we're watching the video then you could maybe do the next yeah one. yeah I, I can bring it i can right. bring them up lovely okay so those of you watching this is the this is the drill we'd like to ask nine questions over the hour so the first three i'm going to ask now if you then email us the answer to all nine and if you email it to admin at nyjc.co.uk i'm sure that nick will also put that in the post uh, so that people can come back to this Facebook post to find that email address. So admin at nyjc.co.uk. And here are the first three questions. What was the first instrument Peter played? Ooh. These answers, by the way, are... Don't you say, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> the answers are in the videos. So if you, if you watch the videos, you will slowly piece together the quiz. The second question, what was the boat he played on in the late 40s called? And when did he emigrate to New York? So what was the first instrument played? What was the name of the boat when he moved, when he was going to America? And when did he actually emigrate to New York? Those are the first three questions. So is that okay with you? Yeah. So would you like to introduce the video that we're going to watch now and just explain maybe in a, just a couple of sentences, why it was called Jazz on a Shoestring. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking a 90 year old. <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's soon gonna be 93, if I remember rightly. <laughs> <laughs> the age <laughs> shifts, the age shifts depending. <laughs> That's your prerogative. It's your prerogative. Yeah. Did you do? You, do, you, do you want to speak, or do you want to ask? Do you, do you want me to to talk about it? Are you sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was when, when the Peter's Bass Club, uh, Clef Club, had effectively gone down, but not finally over, and uh, someone came to us to talk to Peter uh, about that. It was a difficult time, wasn't it? But one of the things that that the the um. Uh, the guy's name was Miller, wasn't it? Um, he eventually took it to the Denver Film Fest, uh, Jazz Film Festival. I don't know if that's still on. But that was a fabulous uh, film festival, wasn't it, Peter? Um, and uh, one of the things the guy noticed is Peter's such an environmentalist, and he manages to do to do things without a great deal of um, uh, money, <laughs> particularly after the club went down. And he said that he had a very natural way of, of making everything stretch <laughs> in those terms. And, 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 and he said in terms of music as well. So that, that was why he, he decided to call it that. Yeah. You're very happy with that, weren't you? Yeah. It's very much links to you and things like your environmental concern as well yeah. and, 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 uh, and recycling and stuff. 
So when we come back from watching the video, we're going to welcome to the stage Helena Kay. And Helena has just come back from New York. And so it'd be really oh, nice uh, the way that you talk about New York and now for Helena to talk about her love of New York. I thought it would be really nice across the decades for us to see that it's still got it. Even so, let's find out what it's got when we get back. And Helena, just a little clue, clue that in the chat are the next three questions. So when we come back, Helena, if you could read the questions for the next section of the quiz but in the meantime just to remind everybody admin at nyjc.co.uk with the answers but for now nick i think you're going to press go and we're going to see everybody in about 18 minutes so sit back put your feet up and enjoy this fantastic video it gives an amazing insight into the wonderful peter Ind. enjoy to listen to the American Forces Network, I think it was broadcasting from Munich, and uh, there was a certain amount of jazz on the BBC, but mostly of the earlier jazz. The thing about AFN was that it was the things that were happening there and then, as they were happening, and that's what made it exciting. I learned to play the violin at school, and I joined the school orchestra and so forth. But to me, the violin uh, was always at a disadvantage because I wanted to play with other musicians. And apart from the, the practicing on my own at home and then once a week with the school orchestra, it was kind of empty. So we had an old piano that I used to uh, fiddle around with. And uh, I got hold of a piano tutor. And from what I knew of the violin, I started to learn the bass clef and began, began to get the hang of the piano. Now on those old tutors, the chords were really laid out very simply and there was no actual chord structure as such, but I began to recognize patterns. And although as a kid I couldn't have given names to them, they were really the essence of learning the chordal aspect of harmony. But uh, because it was the war years and there were very few musicians around, there were so many gigs, I soon got the hang of it and began to work extensively. And by the time I was 16, the first real family squabbles occurred because at 16 I found myself earning more than my old man and that didn't help for the harmony in the home, as it were. Um, my father used to play piano, my mother played violin to very, in a very limited way. And off time as a kid, you know, after I'd gone to bed, I'd hear my father playing the piano, and that I always loved to hear him. He played like classics and things, you know. And he was no great musician, but he loved the music, and I could hear that in the, in the playing. So it was natural, really, for me to want to play. I just enjoyed it. Looking back on it, it would have been much better for me if I'd have had some real training at that stage, but I didn't, you know, so that's the way it went. By the time I was 16 and working in gigs and that, I enrolled in the Trinity College of Music in London as a part-time student. And I studied with uh, a man called Douglas Muse, who became one of the uh, main people of that, uh, that college. And uh, he obviously took an interest in me, although I didn't recognize it at the time. In fact, I used to be scared to go in for a lesson because if I hadn't practiced much, I would think, you know, he was really going to get irate. And when I finally quit, I realized he, how he was quite disappointed because he obviously saw something in me. 
But by that time, 16, 17, I'd picked up a bass and was starting to learn to play that and was gigging around. And uh, then when the chance came to work on the liners between Southampton and New York, I took that and I worked for 18 months on the Queen Mary. And that's what introduced me to the New York jazz. And by that time, I was away and that's where I wanted to be. I first got to New York in 1949. The music was so inspiring. I'd never heard anything like it. This was the way to play music. Instinctively, I loved it. But I also had a kind of guilt feeling about it, like it wasn't proper. Classical music and church music was proper music, and this was kind of, you know, raunchy, loose, uh, not quite right somehow. But because I loved it so much, I thought, well, that's what, that's what I enjoy, you know. By uh, the time I had started work on the Queen Mary, I'd been a professional musician for a number of years. And uh, I'd already had the experience of doing broadcasts on the BBC and doing concert work and so forth, and had, had already begun to make a reputation as a bass player, as a young, up-and-coming jazz bass player in this country. So. I kind of felt my oats, even though maybe my abilities were not that well developed, but I already had a certain amount of acclaim, so I began to feel like, you know, somebody to be reckoned with. Um, I soon learned that I had a lot more to learn, a lot longer to go before I could really use that reputation. Most people in the late 40s, very few traveled by air, I mean, the Duke of Windsor, Duke of Duchess of Windsor used to come across on that boat. I remember um, Eartha Kitt coming across, Nat King Cole with his trio. Uh, so many celebrities, film and stage celebrities and politicians and so forth. So um, we used to get uh, either to see them or to know them. Or, and it was just, a, it was like living a, a life quite different than than what I had known before. And already, I suppose, subconsciously, I was beginning to see the English culture as somewhat stilted. And what with the uh, rationing during the war, which went on, of course, after the war for some years, it just seemed to, England seemed a very gray and un, uninviting place. And after seeing New York and all that, all those lights and the life there and the electric energy that's part of New York and still is to this day. Uh, I couldn't but want to be there. And I think many of the musicians that I worked with had the same desire. Not all of them decided to go over, but a number did. I mean, George Shearing went over. He went over before I did. Um, Ralph Sharon, who then... Uh, uh, has become the accompanist and arranger for Tony Bennett, um, some other jazz musicians, Derek Smith, Ronnie Ball, uh, quite a number emigrated to the States and made a reputation in music. But when I got to New York, the, this famous jazz street, 52nd Street, was still in existence. 1949, it was going strong. By 1950, it began to go and they began to demolish all those uh, um, brownstone houses which had housed these little jazz clubs. So it, the decay had already set in. But in 1949, it was just magic. And we used to go from club to club. There was so much music to hear. I mean, you could go in one club and hear Billie Holiday. You could go in another club and hear Charlie Parker with Bud Powell. Um, the person that influenced me most at that time was the piano player Lenny Tristano. He had an entirely new approach to jazz playing. In a way, it probably was closer to a, a classical tradition, although Lenny would have been horrified if I'd have described it as that. But it appealed to me because the musicality, their approach to playing, their dedication to it was uh, much closer to, I suppose, the European tradition. And that got to me 
more so than any of the other music at that time. Another thing is that Lenny had been uh, quite a, a strong influence as a teacher. So a number of us started to take lessons with him while we were still working on the boat. So every two weeks we'd get into New York and have a lesson with Lenny and he really, uh, more than anyone, uh, influenced me in how much there was in jazz and also that it was not just a matter of just letting go and playing a bunch of notes but there was a tremendous discipline behind it. And so from that time on, that has been my music more than anything else. My opinion is the music that came out of the 50s and even the 40s. That's where the vocabulary was developed and where uh, the great pioneering occurred. American way of life from our vantage point seemed looser, much more open. Uh, in those days, with such little travel and no air travel, like, as though you were leaving forever, it was like the old days going to Australia, you know, you never expected to see relatives for many, many years. So it was a bit scary. There was no problem in getting a visa, you just go to the American Embassy and the British quota was undersubscribed. So I arrived in New York, uh, I was met by some friends, so that was helpful, you know, it wasn't quite so bad. They uh, said, oh, we're living at this block here, this is a musician's block, and uh, I got a little furnished room in that block with a lot of other musicians and uh, started to gig around and uh, uh, the affluence was what was so amazing. I soon got myself a car, we toured New England over a weekend, I mean I, I really travelled around that country and it was so cheap to do so. One of the things that I became aware of when I first went to New York and studied with Lenny Tristano was the essence of rhythm and particularly of learning uh, cross rhythms, how one rhythm overlaps on another. And then later on I began to realize the identity uh, in relationship between rhythm and harmony. But w Lenny used to have us studying beating two against three, three against four, three against five, four against five, and so forth. And it took a lot of discipline to master that. And I remember one night when the drummer Al Levitt came in, we used to play all night at Lenny's studio in downtown Manhattan. And, and one rainy Saturday night, Al comes in all excited and said, I've just got off the Crosstown bus. And his wipers were going four against five, and he didn't even know it. On a simple level, if we play uh, uh, just an interval of a perfect fifth, say a C and G on the piano, and you can try it if you record it, and then slow it down many, many times. You can do it with a two-speed recorder. You slow it down once and then re-record that and slow it down. And eventually, you can hear not an interval of a perfect fifth, but you hear a rhythm. And the rhythm is two against three, one of the simplest rhythms in music. So the intervals correspond to rhythms of varying complexity. So there is this identity, a functional identity between rhythm and harmony. And then this goes into the world of color. If we take the interval of uh, the diminished fifth, which was used so much in bebop particularly, and if we look at that interval and, and look at its relationship in terms of vibration, it's like complementary colors. So when the impressionists painted, if they painted a green field or a tree, they use the complementary to stress the liveness. And that complementary is in nature. And it's like a way of expressing nature with a fullness that the normal palette of just saying, well, that's green, I'll just paint green, would never convey. So again, music 
uh, art, color, harmony, rhythm, all these have identical and interrelated laws. I have an archive of taped jazz, which I think is, represents a slice of history in jazz as well. I would love to have done more, and in retrospect, I wished I had somehow managed to do more recording. The archive goes back to the middle 50s, where the period when I was living and working in New York, when I had my own studio, and there's some wonderful music from that time. And my artistic ambition now is to make some of this wonderful music available, and hopefully, to a worldwide audience. It merits it. There is some beautiful things. There was a lot of activity in that time. This was the late 70s. But then it got too noisy for the neighbors, you see. And so I was faced with either shutting down altogether or finding alternate premises. And a friend of mine had a little studio in that Hoxton Square area. And she said, oh, there's a building uh, going in Holston Square, everything would suit you, you see. So uh, I negotiated for it and duly bought it, and we opened then a 24 track studio in Holston Square. And then six months later, we shifted all the 16 track gear, and that's how it all started. It involved planning permission to turn these old uh, warehouse buildings into studios, and while I was at it, I thought, well, what shall I do with the basement? And the idea was we had a little, we would have a little club there. Uh, so that the two recording studios going, it would be a hangout for musicians. By 1984, the recording business in that way was beginning to decline. There were so many studios opening in London. But until that time, it was just absolutely chock-a-block, you know, we were just booked out. Uh, I could no longer spend time engineering or to hire engineers because it was just too much of a business to run. And at the same time, Wave was a small jazz label, which was how it started. And uh, so we were releasing albums from time to time and, and the bulk of the money came in through the recording, letting out the studio. You know. Music has not come to me easy. I've worked very, very hard. But when you know something, you just know it. You know, it gives you, it's your strength. And the strength I have is what I've achieved in that realm. One of the things I think of in, term to, in terms of my relation to music is that I know how I can express myself. I know what I've learned in terms of musical structure and harmony and the discipline that's needed to create jazz, particularly jazz on a sequence. And not just to run through the changes, but to actually create on in that idiom. And I know the discipline that's involved in that. And to get beyond, so that you've got the discipline and you go beyond and you actually create. So I'm not, I can't be the, the arbiter on all the things that are happening. And also, because there's so much to listen to, it's impossible anyway, but at least I know my own strength in what I can do. But one of the things I th that uh, I think of in, in those terms is Johann Sebastian Bach wrote in that Baroque manner at a time when it was at its end. So he was, toward the end of his life, put down as being rather old hat with the era of Mozart and Beethoven, the new music was coming in and Bach's music was discarded pretty much. By the middle of the 19th century, uh, Felix Bartholdi Mendelssohn, for my own personal evolution, to come to grips with music has been very important for me and a big stabilizer and a big learning experience. 
and having devoted myself very diligently to it, I feel that I have something to give, and have given something in music, in the particular idiom in jazz. All right. Fantastic. What a great, it was a real privilege watching the video and editing it. It was just, it made my, filled my life with great joy for many hours of just reflecting and seeing the story and see the footage as well. I just thought that was fantastic to be able to see the footage of, uh, of New York and then of the bass clef as well. Come back and join us, Pete and Sue. <laughs> How did it feel looking back and reminiscing? It's a really powerful video, such joy and creativity. Well, we put everything we put into it, you know. Yeah, shows. And thank goodness you did because it was, you know, a real foundation for us to then take our own creativity forward. You know, it was such an important role model. And I, and I know we've spoken about it and you probably didn't think at the time that you were being a role model, but you know, as you were doing your, all the, all the things you were doing, it just, we followed in your wake, basically. You made it easier yeah. for us. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> what I'd like to do is, um, I'd like to welcome to the stage two guests that we've got. One is a saxophonist who's just spent a year recently, just come back from New York, and we work together in a band called Interchange. Can we welcome to the stage Helena Kay? Hello, Helen. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you? It's nice to be here. Might you introduce yourself to Pete and the rest of the viewers? Yes. Uh, my name's Helena Kay. I'm from Scotland. And yeah, I've spent the, a year in New York uh, just, you know, just before COVID hit. Um, yeah, it was I had an amazing time there. Um, I was going to mention as well, um, I actually met Peter um, at the Cheltenham Jazz Festival in 2012. Um, oh, I was playing in the Fife Youth Jazz Orchestra. Well, yeah, as, as part of a competition. Is that with Richard Michael? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Richard Michael. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, where, where did you study before you went to New York? Um, I was at uh, the Guildhall School of Music and Drama for four years. <laughs> Yeah. And I think you also played in Tommy Smith's band as well. Yeah, yeah, in the TSYGO yeah. before that. Mm -hmm. So I, you and I got to know each other just before you went to New York, so between graduating, also the Peter Whittingham, don't forget to mention the Peter Whittingham Award as well. You you won that, which year was that? Uh, 2017. And then we, we met around that time and we worked together in Interchange and I knew all that time that you were investing a lot of time and energy into making the move to New York. So, but then we didn't have the chance because of COVID to meet up and talk about it when you got back. So what yeah. was it that motivated you? Why did you want to go to New York? Um, well, I guess studying jazz and studying this music, um, my absolute favorite musicians are, come from New York. And, uh, and yeah, some of the musicians that I look up to who are, are are over there as well um and i had a couple of you know short visits to new york like kind of jazz holidays <laughs> and just fell in love with it really and, and i thought i felt like i could learn a lot um by actually being there and just immersing myself in the scene over there and like having some lessons and just checking it all out yeah there's so much music every night it's unbelievable 
and and your passion yeah. to be there and to you know follow it it reminded me peter remind me very much of your video and what you were talking about when you went there i'm wondering hearing helena talk does it resonate does it bring back memories <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't want to move back again well we're, we're going to show a bit with a conversation shortly of us talking about new york and making the move but um helena wondered whether you've got any questions that you'd like to actually ask peter oh um not obligatory but if there's anything that came <laughs> because of your love of new york yeah something about new york yeah. uh well i'm just, i mean i'm so interested in uh, you know, your period with Lenny Tristano. Um, I'm a big Konitz fan. Um, yeah, me too. Well. So I wonder um, what was uh, the biggest lesson that you learned from Lenny Tristano? Well, I don't know whether I can remember it as a specific lesson. It was just a whole the whole thing, what he understood, what he played, and uh, people still have to listen to what he played. He's still such a big influence now as well. Martin Speak, who's one of our tutors regularly, is talking about the Tristano school now. It's become, you know, people yeah. talk, he was such an influence. And the picture of you with Tristano really is striking because it's you are the age or only a few years older than the youngsters that we work with. And often, especially listening to recordings, people lose touch with where was that recording in relation to their own personal journey. Mark Hodgson regularly plays um, albums to our young musicians and says, how old do you think the rhythm section was here? And often there'll be recordings where they are only a couple of years older than the young musicians that we're working with, just to give them that ownership of, you know, you're on that same journey of establishing yourself as jazz musicians and um, yeah. we've got another bass player who's similar age to the photo of you uh, with Tristano and that's Hamish Knuckles so Hamish come and join us Hamish did NYJC at the same time as Nick I think so come and say hello Hamish hello very nice to see you all and uh, thank you for having me today I'm Hamish I'm a double bassist um and yeah, I've been, I wanted to thank you, Peter, because I've been re over lockdown, I've really been enjoying your uh, time, for time for Improvisation record and I've been playing along to it. So it was a great joy when I couldn't play with other people to play. Oh, me that. too. I've been doing that. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Be yeah. Incredible. It's been a real, real joy. Oh, big round of applause. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Peter. <laughs> And that's one of the prizes, everybody. That's one of the prizes. <laughs> there you go, Peter. <laughs> Fantastic. Hamish, I think you've got a couple of questions that you'd like to actually ask Peter. Peter, I tried miserably to ask these questions when we did our interview. And I was just, because I'm not a bass player, I didn't, I didn't nail it. So I've asked Hamish to come back and ask it. Professional to professional. Hamish, <laughs> why don't you tell people who you play with, just to give a bit of an oh, overview. Oh, yeah. So I play with... Um... Uh, Steve Steve Williamson and I play with the New Civilization Orchestra and I play with various other ensembles such as uh, uh, yeah various various bands um, so, um, uh, but yeah enough about me <laughs> um, but I, so yeah, Peter you know Crosby very well as well don't you yes, yes indeed indeed and uh, he he asked me to send his best regards in fact <laughs> brilliant. Mm. So, would you like to ask Peter your questions? I think, Peter, yeah. you're, you're going to get a better version of it now because uh, Hamish actually knows what he's talking about. I was just wondering, Peter, um, when you when you were studying and playing with uh, Lenny Tristano and Lee Connitz and Paul Blay and people like that, the harmony and the language and uh, that you were learning and studying was that um, was that expected to be in the form of long extended bass solos and was that was that the done thing at the time and was that also something that you've been doing? If so, was that something you've been doing in Britain beforehand? 
before emigrating? No, no, it was mainly where after I was either working on the Queen Mary yep. or uh, mostly the American influence. Yes. So it's really significant. If you hadn't been there, then you wouldn't be playing the way that you're playing now. No. <laughs> and we wouldn't have been influenced and we wouldn't be learning from you either. And oh, then, <laughs> there was also a technical thing, wasn't there, Hamish? Yeah. Which you, This will bring back memories, Sue and Peter. It's about something to do with the fourth finger. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> because, as I understand it, did, you were playing the in that four finger style. Did you learn it from a teacher in in England? Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. And um, so d was that something that really helped with playing in that kind of modern jazz bebop? Oh yes, it was. Yeah. yeah. And was it something that was adopted by your contemporaries in New York? Because it, yeah, I, yeah. yeah, it must have been a new thing at the time for yeah other bassists. Yeah. It's wow. uh, I can't get my hands around it. I've got tiny little hands, unfortunately. So it's uh, I, they're too small to do the four finger technique. I think. <laughs> so, might you explain really quickly, Hamish, what it is you would like to be able to do that you can't do? What is the fourth finger technique that you're sort of striving for? So it's it, is it that you have a semitone covered by each finger? So it, it's um, uh, as opposed to a, a tone, which is the mm -hmm. uh, sort of more traditional thing. You get uh, a tone and a half in the hand position. Is that correct? I'm, I feel like I'm explaining it to the expert here. But... <laughs> yeah, got the right end of the stick there, Peter. Keep, keep still, keep, keep on going. Yeah. Do you want to add something? Can we, that, that in fact, when you, we've been, we're writing the, the book at the moment for, about Peter's time in New York. Um, yes. And one of the things that's really intriguing is that when you went there, because of that four finger, you you were you, you were seen as quite special, and you yeah. you actually had a couple of people that came to work with you, yeah. to 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 talk to you to to work with you about that, didn't you? Yeah. Particularly Charlie Mingus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you were saying. Uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm I'm mimicking Peter, but it's, you know, I, I think I think it was really good that you met him. We've just been doing this that you met him again at the end of, of his life, and he was in Amsterdam, and he and he said to you, and I thought it was really classic. He said, "I know this, and you know this. You played all that high shit on." Oh, can we say that? <laughs> it, it, it's a quote. Yeah. Are we allowed it? Have you play, played all that? Anyway, that yeah. All that high mm, mm, on the bass, right? <laughs> and he came to play with you on on on, on and so it took to work with you on that. And so did Percy Heath. Yeah. You know, the, 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 in those days, it was it was it's quite a unique selling point. I mean, you you said it gave you quite an edge. Yeah. <laughs> I think we um we also we discuss it a bit in the next video, so it'd be lovely. All right. to, yeah, it'd be lovely to go into the next video and pick that conversation up. Before we do that, I'm wondering, Helena, might you read out the three questions? Hamish is going to do the last three later on, but everyone that's tuning in, there's a quiz that's been thread through the conversation, and we've had the first three questions at the beginning. So if you've just joined us now, you can always watch the video again to rewind for the three questions. But Helen is going to read out the next three questions for everybody. So if you, the nine questions all together, if you could email the answers to us at admin um, at nyjc.co.uk, then we will be um, looking at the first nine winners will get prizes. So over to you, Helena. Okay, so question number four is who did Peter study with in New York? <laughs> Uh, right. Question number five. Can you name another bass player that Peter met in the early 50s and they became good friends? And then question number six. Do you know the famous jazz suite in New York that was still open when Peter moved to New York? 
Right. <laughs> <laughs> you can't enter your own quiz. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> to win because <laughs> you don't want to go to the post office to post them all <laughs> brilliant so over to you nick we're going to watch the next video which is just for everyone that's watching it's a, a conversation that we had about 10 days ago and some of the things that are in the quiz and that we've sort of all the questions that i asked pete came out of having watched jazz on a shoestring and various other things as well and just to remind everybody when I was the same age as a lot of the young people that we're working with, or maybe just a few years older, I was going to the bass clef, which were, I would learn a lot from Peter and all the musicians just by watching and listening. I, as I said, I was so shy, I didn't speak to anyone, but I didn't need to speak to anyone because all of the learning was in the listening. And, uh, and it was, I feel really privileged to have had that education. So over to you, Nick. Let's have a listen to the 20 minute conversation that we had. We've edited sort of salient moments from it, a lot of it relating to the quiz. So see you all in about 18 minutes time, at which point Hamish will be doing the last three questions. So any questions anybody's got for Peter or for Helena or for Hamish, it, while you're watching, pop them in the comments of the face, uh, Facebook post and we'll be able to answer them. I'm looking forward to watching this. So see you all in a few minutes. Over to you, Nick. See you all in a bit. I think it was the, it was the dance bands you said that got that, that got you started. There were Benny Goodman. There was there were all of the Glenn Miller. Because of the uh, of the war and all of the of the soldiers and the dancers, yeah. the radio it sounds like the radio had quite a significant influence on you as a musician. Well, uh, it was radio was where it was at in those days. And when you were in a group, what what music would you be playing, sort of in the groups? Um, Dance music, or yes, yeah. Because the book, you've been saying that you've gone into swing. Yeah. I mean, they were getting in swing, you know, from the from the dance band. And so there's this these young kids, eleven or twelve, and they're in a classical orchestra. And periodically, he'd, he'd be saying to them, "You do not swing." <laughs> <laughs> so the swing music was really hip then, wasn't it? It was current. It was of its time. Yeah. So that must have been so exciting to be around it, as it was coming new. Well, we enjoyed it, you know. We just did. That was it. How old were you when you took up the bass? Late teens, I guess. Yeah, about 16, you said. Yeah. And from also around about that time, was that when you were heading to Trinity College of Music? You were very proactive in things, weren't you? You decided that there were sort of some gaps in your knowledge and you wanted to fill those gaps. So yeah. how did you hear about Trinity College of Music? Well, it was one of the main places in London, you know. So you go for it. Not being a bass player myself, but your technique fascinates a lot of jazz bass players. And ah. so what is it that, what's the extra bit? <laughs> what is it that you acquired from <laughs> lessons that they're all going, oh, I want to know about Pete's technique. You've got greater fluidity. That's what he's, yeah. you told me. Is that, is that you, you, you've you you've got a, a bigger range. Yeah, one, two, three, four. Yeah. Or is it just that you your technique itself is a bit more uh, is a bit more developed than the usual? So, yeah. that, that one, yeah. yeah. But that's what fascinated Mingus, wasn't it? Yeah. That you you actually get, they used, a number of them came to see you, didn't they, yeah. in, in in New York? because that, that, that he could reach with things that they couldn't ah. and, and 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 so that and then you could get a, a fluidity that's I mean, you're talking to a non-bass player here but i mean yeah, but even still that's particularly fascinating about mingus because he had cl such classical lessons didn't he? he was studying with the principal bass player was it from one of the city's philharmonia orchestras so so that's interesting that you know he still you're still streets ahead of them all, Peter. <laughs> it, isn't it because, but you'd use the classical, um, uh, the, 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 those techniques to actually work on, on, on jazz improvisation. So Peter had made that, that shift, as I understand it. 
So I've got one question, um, Peter, before we move on to leaving home and going on to the Queen Mary, before we get that far, I'm wondering, was painting already part, a really important part of yes. what you do? Yeah. And, and so, because we hear so much about what you were doing as a, a musician, but we never really hear much when we're talking amongst ourselves as musicians, we don't hear about where the painting was going at the same time. So it'd be lovely to hear how you, how you first discovered painting and you know what, what were you doing at home painting-wise? Mostly uh, landscape. And uh, did you have lessons or did you know other young painters? Was it the same sort of community as working with musicians sort of, or were you no. in isolation? I was all, all my own. Wow. I just loved it. Yeah, I'm not surprised. And, and later on, when we've got a lovely link to a website that's got some beautiful pieces of yours on, and you know, we'd love to share some so that the people that are watching can see some of your work because it is truly beautiful. It's really, Thank you. really great. Who are your main influences in painting? Well, it was the impressionists generally. So, taking the, your your base and your paintbrushes, did you, both paintbrushes go onto the Queen Mary with you? I think so, yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. So how did you get the gig on the Queen Mary? Well, it was part of the British scene then, you know. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I just graduated into it. Uh, and, and how long would it be? How long would each crossing sort of be when you were booked? Five days. Five days there, five days back? Yep. How long were you doing the ships before you decided, I'm going to move to New York? 49 to 51, you were, you were on the boat, weren't you? Yeah. You emigrated yeah. in 51, didn't you? Yeah. That was <sighs> very exciting to, to make that decision as a, a young well, it was, man. It was, it was automatic when I did it. Oh, you know, that's where I want to be, you know. Yeah. And also because having spent so much time in New York and in the States generally, uh, it seemed obvious that's where I would be, you know. Right. So it's like homecoming. This, yeah. is how, this is home. One of the questions that the youngsters are asking about your time when, when you're having lessons with uh, Tristano, it was um, how, how was he towards your transferring all that language onto the double bass and, you know, using it with your new solos? Did he see you as doing it as a pianist or? But was he also saying, let's do this as a bass player? Well, it was it was part of bass playing in those days, you know. Yeah. You can see that, like you say, with people like Mingus and all the other bass players that were around yeah. at the time. Yeah. They saw it, they had the same desire. That's yeah. not just there to add the fundamentals underneath the rest of the rhythm section. <laughs> It's, it feels from hearing you talk as if that period was a real period of discovery. Yeah. And so I think for the young musicians who are now in their own period of discovery, I think they would yes. really love to yes. hear, yeah. you know, hear from the perspective of somebody that was a similar age going to New York, because it was a totally different scene to how it is now, but it's the scene that we've built on in order to have the scene that we've got now. So yes. I'm yeah. just wondering who who were the people that you met? Maybe it was just everybody, uh, but were there particular people you met who really sort of ignited something in you? So it was Tristano? Yes. You met Charlie Parker? Oh, yeah. Young, and um, Stan Getz? Oh, yeah. Buddy Rich? Yeah. And uh, I'm wondering, what, were, what was it like working with Bird and Lester Young? I should imagine a lot of the learning was not spoken. It was just getting on the getting up and playing and learning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what was what was Charlie Parker like to play with? He was more just playing, not talking. Yeah. yeah. But, was, but, but to play along, with, you know, to that strength of playing and his sense of time, you know. Oh, yeah, with the guys like Bird, like Lenny, they did They were playing their own thing, you know. Yeah, there's newness about what they were doing. That's right. Yeah. That must have been really exciting to be part of. And did it challenge you then to find your own newness? Maybe it did. 
I just work with it, you know. Yeah. Well, talk a little bit about, about Roy Aldridge. I mean, he was such a good friend. Yeah, he became such a good friend. Yeah, what was Roy like in his own right? What was he, he was a great musician. Just so open. I guess with them um, asking what they were like to work with, I'm just wondering if they were sort of very, if they communicated their ideas or they just leapt in and, you know, just uh, the rhythm section followed, if they were very sort of ever sort of gave guidance about how they wanted to do a, a number or if, or if they just ca counted it off and played it and then that was it, you were all in the... Yeah, that's right, yeah. So... And if you weren't up to what any of them wanted, you didn't last. So that is, that's inspiration as well, isn't it? I better yes. keep my better keep striving because I don't want to fall. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, a lot of the um, recognition came from the association. And then the Newport Festival. Yeah. But you were around for so many firsts. It's fantastic. I love this because I we get it firsthand. We get to hear from you personally. So. The first Newport Festival. Who were you playing with at the festival? Oh God, I'd have to look that up. Playing <laughs> <laughs> with Lenny. Do you remember? Right. Yeah. With with Lenny, Lenny Tristan. So it's great to know that you know, the the audience sizes were big enough. For all these festivals. So and generally when you were playing. Gigs were well attended around that. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then I think you started to get involved in recording, the recording side of things, not just as yes. a player, but hands on yeah. as an engineer. And this particularly will be interesting to our young musicians because a lot of them are involved in uh, music production. Yeah. So uh, I think they would love to hear about how did you actually get it? You were doing a lot of the engineering, not you weren't just in studios playing, you actually hands on. It seemed natural, you know. Yeah, you're involved in it. So it went from there, you know. And so, would there would there be periods of time when you your base was staying at home, you were going to the studio to actually, you know, be the main engineer on other people's albums? Yeah, on occasion, yeah. Because yeah. I think <laughs> Atlantic and Verve, Beth, uh, Bethlehem and Warwick are in the one of the articles. Yeah. Did, did these labels have different vibes? So did they have sort of different attitudes towards the music? Yeah. yeah. Ah. And who were the engineers and the producers that you enjoyed working with at the time? Rudy Van Gelder? Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, but there, there's your reaction. <laughs> Rudy's just another one of the guys. But yeah. Because he was involved in so many things. It's the old Rudy, you know. When Peter was first doing the recording, people like, you got Lenny's recording equipment. Lenny recorded, didn't he? Um, but the, uh, the, the, there was you and there was Rudy Van Gelder. Van, Rudy Van Gelder recorded in his parents' front room. Right, you wow. know. And uh, I mean, and, and, and you would take stuff, that you, you would run back um from from the gig to new york pick up equipment and take it over and you would be playing and having it recording it, it was really um not amateur but you know it, it was early days of recording which i should imagine kids these days don't they can't imagine it in that sense it sounds like there was a lot of the gear was quite portable so i think when we talk when we think about recording we presume everyone's walked into a recording studio but it sounds like it was you know, you were actually taking some of the gear to the venues where you were playing? Yes. Did they, did the things come from the wartime? Is that, is that there's been a big technology change? Well, it was that. It was, it was still developing, you know. I mean, it was very early days, wasn't yeah. it? I mean, people didn't like, they didn't like there to be stereo recording, <laughs> you know. In your mono. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the first time multi-tracking happened was that if I remember rightly you were working with Tristano and he overdubbed something yeah. Yeah. so that was quite a 
that was quite a major sort of development yeah. to be able to do that. Yeah. But tell it wasn't well received, was it? No. They thought it was trickery. Yeah, yeah, that's the morale of the music. You know, you don't do that. <laughs> People wanted to know how he'd done it. Yeah. Did they think it was taking integrity out of it all? Is that what they were questioning? Because the, it, it facilitates other magic. There are other things you can do with that option, but what was their concern at the time? Yeah, at the time it was like, the recording engineer was taking advantage. Oh. <laughs> Rising above their station. <laughs> <laughs> but you saw it other. You saw it as a, a fantastic opportunity to do to take creativity further. That's right. And didn't you in, in some respects get into recording because you were really trying to, to get that specific improvisations yeah. you know how to capture improvisation yeah i mean that that is you even now i mean i think i think when um when uh, lee came over you know i mean he, he that's one of the things he was saying about you and, and improvisation wasn't he is that you're just trying to capture the very moment yeah. even now yeah is that lee Konitz? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the two of you together and with Warren Marsh as well. It's just masterful. It is in the moment. It's, there's no yeah, doubt about yeah, it. It's yeah. magic. All those recordings, oh, I feel really very lucky that I heard them so early on in my own formative period because it, I just take it as read that that's how people play because I heard you all doing it, you know. That's one of the things, the biggest challenges I've found with everything that I do in that, you know, jazz was, it turned 100 years, it's over 100 years old now. And so it, it's almost like we're looking at the orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment playing on period instruments, the way they <laughs> treat the music. <laughs> and yet the whole ethos is about being true to your now, isn't it? Well, yeah, in a, yeah you're in a cell. Have you always felt like that? Because when, you know, on that lovely video, uh, the interview that you do of Jazz on a Shoestring, and you talk about that, and we're going to put some of those extracts in, if that's okay with you. Right, yeah. You talk a lot about that side of things. And I'm wondering, had you always been in touch with your creative self? I think so. Um, not always. Uh, looking at myself as being that created that good they're just trying to put in what I do with the scene. Mm -hmm. There are sort of four key questions that the youngsters have asked. One of them was really keen to know about the time for improvisation when and that idea of recording a rhythm section. So I think that was the first time that a rhythm section on its own it was actually bass and drums, is that right? It was recorded. Time yeah. for improvisation. Yeah. Yeah. So the so you put the tracks down and then you got a fantastic response. I loved I listened to the Tristano recording and I just cannot believe that that is Tristano playing over a pre-recorded bass and drum. <laughs> it's fantastic. What what's your take of it having yeah. been involved in the process? What's your take on it? It sounds so spontaneous and there's so much danger still in there and risk taking and in the moment. Yes. It's unbelievable. Well, the great the, the improvisers allowed themselves to improvise and used that as a basis. Whereas second rate ones tend to want it prescriptive. Might you explain to us what happened when you moved to Hoxton and and the sort of the building you found and what you used it for? Well, playing and recording, that was it. Home from home. Yeah, I mean, basically, you had this whole group of guys who, who actually, you know, plied into to, to doing it up. And then, they, and then some of them were engineers or worked in the, in the club. Yeah. So it was very much... You know, done on well, it was done on a shoestring, was it? That's why that guy called that film.
Brilliant. That's going to be one of my all time most favorite conversations in my entire life. Thank you, Peter, for that. And Sue as well, you, you're always such a fantastic contributor. It's great. You, you, I think you could sit and write a book <laughs> yourself if we just. <laughs> well, 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 we are. <laughs> <laughs> but the <laughs> thing is, is I mean, the, the problem is when you get to, 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 to 90, in your 90s, you've, you've got so many things. How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> You tell me, you oh, tell me. <laughs> but the New York book is it's fantastic because Peter's always written. He, I mean, haven't you? I mean, particularly he wrote after Bass Clef went down because he was so sad about that. So he wrote huge amounts. So we've just got masses to cut and paste. But then we, we'll look at something, won't we? And it, it'll spark up new memories in you. Yeah. And, and new, new thoughts and things. So... It's 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 so interesting, to, you know, to, to go through all those memories. Well, Helen so, was yeah. texting. Helena was texting me during it with keenly keen to ask a couple more questions. So Helena, <laughs> come back and ask ask away. I'm sure Hamish has got a few things, but Helena, if if you want to kick off, you had a couple of questions you wanted to ask. Hamish, come and join us as well. Hi. Yes, I can't turn my video on for some reason, but um, I'm <laughs> I'm just interested to know. Um, Oh, here we go. Thank there you. is. Uh, I'm just interested to know where you lived in New York. Where I, oh gosh, you, you had a, you had a number of places, didn't you? I mean, you, you, do you want me to answer? Because mm. I've been putting all that together. So, so, um, you lived. You arrived, and you went to a really rough hotel. Uh, yeah. And you spent the, the whole of the first night in the middle of the room when he switched the lights on and there were cockroaches everywhere. Oh, no. <laughs> and then oh. Warren, Warren, um, Warren Marsh and um, uh, a couple of them were in a, a rooming house, one of these brownstone rooming houses. It was really, really big apartments. And so you rented, um, uh, you rented a furnished room there, didn't you? And then you had a first loft. Um, over the Hudson, and then you ended up, didn't you, with a um, with your own loft? I can't remember. It was it was down on the um, near near the Soho area, wasn't it? That's where you had your loft that you did most of your recording. So you lived in quite a few places, didn't you? What What was interesting, Pete, when we were talking, and I realised it's uh, my error that I forgot to put this bit in the video. Um, when we were talking, you explained the significance of the loft culture and how it influenced the bebop because it gave the. the yeah. Want to yeah. say a few words about that because that that was like wow when you told me that. <laughs> it's such a significant thing, but it wouldn't. Not having been there, you would never have put that together. But when when you were explaining about the because the lofts were so cheap, so many jazz musicians lived in them and that meant you could all meet quite easily and play together and build up the stamina to play the, the music. Yeah. That we would, Hamish and Helena, I don't think we would have ever worked that out for ourselves as being the best ethnomusicologists in the world. We would never have equated that, I don't think. Do you think Ham Hamish and Helena? It's incredible, yeah, and that, that, the, um, to hear about the, the, how you guys played for such long periods of time and, uh, and um, it starts to make sense of how it's also killing. <laughs> <laughs> did you, you used to have things like regular sessions with many did once a week or twice yeah. a week? Yeah, once and, a week. And, and what did you do? You'd, all, you'd play all night? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes you'd play all night. And then there's the, the thing about the lofts is, of course, you can make as much noise as you wanted because they were in the commercial district and there was nobody there at night, was there? And they were cheap. But but didn't you tell me you, you weren't supposed to live in them, but everybody did? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a really famous... Um, the, um, the, the, they've written a book about the Manhattan lofts, the jazz lofts in particular. Um, oh. I'm, now, I'm now not going to remember the name of the, the photographer, very famous photographer. And he, he lived in one of the lofts. And, and Pete, you're, you're in. 
there's some photos of, of you. We didn't we didn't know. Do you remember? We, I was looking through something about Loft, and all of a sudden this picture came up, and you look at it and you say, "That's you, Peter." <laughs> <laughs> and we chased it down, and it was for sale, wasn't it? It was for sale, but it was about a thousand dollars, so we couldn't oh, wow. we, we couldn't buy it. But I mean, that, that, I think that's isn't that. I think we put that pic that we put that on the um, uh, up on your uh, website. I think you know, but but it, but uh, but someone did a, a, an assessment, didn't they, of the Manhattan lofts? So people would play there. They'd play all night, or people would uh, uh, come and practice, and then they they'd go on to they'd do gigs, and then they'd, uh, late at night sometimes they'd go and. Play. So you sounded as though you played virtually all the time. Know, yeah. But you were young, weren't you? That's what you say. It, it, did, it did make a difference. It did make a difference. <laughs> yeah, being young. Yeah, yeah. But did I mean, you you, anywhere else? When you moved back to um, England, well, you lived in Wales as well. Was it? Was there? Were there places in Wales and England that you could find where you could do the same thing? You know, uh, other premises or not? To a certain extent, yes. Yeah. Right. Where, what, can you remember where? Your house? Yeah. Amiens Park Road? Yeah. Oh, wow. Brilliant. <laughs> Peter bought a house, it, it, it was 13 rooms. He knocked various rooms out. Wow. But the house was known as, as was it the Lonely Hearts house? Because any, any musicians who, you know, needed a place uh, would go there. So it's for about, what two or three years? Yeah. There were all sorts of musicians and that around, so there was a lot of playing. But the well, neighbours complained because um, it would have been heaven. It would have been <laughs> heavenly to be there. <laughs> Amish, I think you're going to read the next three questions from the quiz. So everybody, get back to your yeah. pencils. Remember, admin at nyjc.co.uk, and we're going to round off with the three questions from you, Hamish. Okay. Um, so the first question that I've got to read is. What is the name of Peter's recording company? Way. <laughs> You're not to give them the answer. Oh, my dad. My dad's the same. You can't <laughs> do that. <laughs> we're, we're turning ourselves off for a moment here. <laughs> well, you know, we've got the 27 questions left. So <laughs> go for it, Amish. <laughs> the next question is... Um, what was sorry? What was the name of the club that Peter ran in Hoxton? And the next question is, what else did Peter run in the same building? Brilliant. So we're not going to recap the nine questions, which have been reduced to seven <laughs> because of the audience participation. So if you would like to know what the nine questions were, go back and watch this video on Facebook and YouTube. And uh, we've also seen the very, very generous presents that are going to be donated as well. So before we sign off and say a few last words, please, could um, Nick, can you come and join us? Just say a few things about donating and supporting our work. But before doing that, what do you think of the show so far? What an amazing show. So much of a life. I mean, 92. Um, everyone's lived a, a good life at that point. But I think, Pete, that's quite uh, exceptional, all the things that you've done. Absolutely. So, I think a round of applause, everybody, for Mr. Pete Ind. <laughs> How's it feel to look back at 93? Peter? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How does it feel? How do you feel? <laughs> How can you uh, expect an answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope thrilled. What about... What about Delighted. What about uh, the final thing that you'd like to tell young, really young, up and coming jazz musicians? Is there anything you'd like to tell yeah, them? Yeah, just to listen. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> if there was just one thing, I think Helena and Hamish and Nick and myself would agree. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> anything, Hamish, do you want to ask anything else about? the base we're going to wrap up in a couple of seconds but is there any last um i suppose just um when you came back to britain was there 
uh, did you immediately start sort of teaching and kind of imparting this stuff that you'd learned in America? Because there's there's a sort of clear lineage that goes back to your generation coming back from America. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. What about Leeds? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was Leeds, Leeds College. With Bernie Cash? Yeah. P Peter came back and started, they, they actually set up um, at the first jazz course, didn't you? Yeah. But they, they, it had to be called, was it Was it light music? It had to be a light yeah. music course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you got into a bit of trouble, didn't you? Because you were, you were, were, were doing a, having a very participatory uh, approach to it. And all the students used to come in from the other classes. And oh, <laughs> but in those days, you can imagine, you know, I mean, what, what were we talking about? Mid, late 60s? You know, that sort of participation, which you'd done with Lenny and everybody, and you brought back here. It was wow. too early for it, wasn't it? <laughs> it's seeds, and that's why all the conservatoires now have got the jazz courses. You know, you sowed yeah. those early seeds. And Hamish, you went to uh, Trinity as well, didn't you? Yes, I did. Oh, wow. Indeed. And I um, I ran the jazz course, set the jazz course up, and before that, I, I taught harmony to everybody. So though footage in your um, jazz on a shoestring, those students I were actually in my harmony groups. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> And it was so funny when they first had lessons with me because when I went from harmony to being head of jazz, the pianists got annoyed on my behalf and were going to go and talk to the executive because I was being asked to teach Palestrina to Brahms as head of jazz. And they wanted to go and complain on my behalf, but I explained I actually love harmony. I want to carry on teaching it, please. Okay. <laughs> Nick, uh, thanks everybody support the work that we do because we've got so many youngsters who are wanting to work with us and uh, play the music. It's been difficult times. We've got a bursary scheme that's always there for young musicians. It's been particularly difficult with the COVID and we're coming up now to the auditions and the summer school. We've got people applying for travel bursaries to come to the auditions. We All our auditions are free, by the way. So, um, and it costs 50 pound an audition. So if people would like to sponsor one of the auditions and uh, most of the travel normally costs about 70 pound. And then um, the summer school itself, we pay about a third of the youngsters have bursaries on the summer school as well. And so that's worth 2000 pounds each of their places. Wow. And I want to really thank the Leverhulme uh, for funding us for this year, giving us a few scholarships. I'm going to be writing another application tomorrow for, to them for 2022 summer school. But Nick, if people would like to contribute, how do we go about it? So if you'd like to support NYJC in its commitment to making our work accessible to young musicians, no matter what their financial background, please head to nationalyouthjazz.co.uk forward slash donate. And Hamish and Nick, you were both on the same summer school, NYJC. Do you remember? I do yes. indeed. Very nice <laughs> to see you again, Nick. It's good to see you, albeit virtually, but definitely. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll catch up with each other soon, I'm sure, and talk definitely. about I think we're in Percy's, uh, Percy and Izzy's group. I think. Of course, Percy. yeah. <laughs> Indeed, that was it. Was a great time, wasn't it? And it's yeah, really nice to see you again, man. Yeah, definitely. Likewise. Well, we'll definitely get a reunion. It's looking on the cards, Pete. It, I think we're finally going to be let out and be allowed to meet up. Did <laughs> 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 you ever envisage that we'd all be housebound for a year? Yeah. It was such weird times we've been through. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we I, did, let's go for it, Sue. We did get out a couple of times in the in the summer in July. There's um, a local uh, jazz club in Brighton, and they managed to get... Um, they're, they're on the side of the, a small park, and so they, they were able to put seats out there. We had They had live jazz wow. on, a, on a Sunday. Didn't they? John Newey came because he lives down here, but they weren't allowed to have um, a, a drums because <laughs> of, of the residents. But that was lovely, wasn't it? In the summertime, that, that was really nice. I was thinking, how do drums spread the virus? <laughs> it's the noise. It was the noise. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Well, sadly, it's been a wonderful conversation. I could go on forever. And, and I really want to thank you so much, Peter. Before we sign off, and I will leave the last word to Peter, can we please thank Helena Kay, 
Lovely to see you, Helena. And you're going to be back in um, June to have a conversation about your own music. Yeah, yeah, back in June. Have you enjoyed today? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I've enjoyed it so much. Do you want to put a sometime? <laughs> <laughs> Hamish, thank you so much, Hamish. Thank you so much. It's been just amazing to hear from you and it's a real, real honour to be here. Thank you. Anything you'd like to ask, Pete, of uh, Hamish or Helena before we sign off? Um, oh, I, I actually had one, one more question. Um, I was wondering, did you feel you picked up the American attitude after living in New York or did you still feel... Um, very much British and sort of a foreigner in the city. You thought you'd live there forever, didn't you? I thought I'd be there forever. <laughs> 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 I'm glad you're not being there forever because we had you back here and been such an influence, but I can understand why. Did you, um, Helena, you were saying about going to New York, that was what you were craving for isn't it to sort of spend time with that energy and just to see how it felt mm. yeah definitely what was the final outcome do you think for that year oh for me i mean i wish i'd uh had a bit longer really um yeah i think i i, I would have i was just getting started after a year i think yeah mm. but, um yeah there's there's lots more to learn but i certainly learned a lot when i was there you know and i, and I hope i absorbed some of their sort of uh boldness Positivity. Mm. Uh, mm. Yeah, the American attitude. Definitely yeah. heard that in Pete's playing, the boldness and the strength as well. Yeah. 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 How did it feel coming back? Well, yeah, one last question. When you came back to England, did you think everybody was playing quite quietly and quite <laughs> <laughs> politely? <laughs> politely. <laughs> Brilliant. Nick, thank you so much for everything. You've worked your socks off. I'm so thank proud of my JC and what we've achieved. Very much looking forward to our two week holiday now, much deserved. But uh, when we're back, we'll be doing the audition tour going around. I can't wait to hear all the young people playing. We've got 14 days of audition tours, Peter, where we go around um, England. So about nine different cities. Wow. Wow. And then going to the summer mm. school in August. We should be great for a week in Repton in South Derbyshire. And we very much hope that you'll be back again, Peter, to talk to us and and hopefully to meet some of the young people in person at some point as well. Yeah. You'd yeah. love that, wouldn't yeah, you? I would, yeah. yeah. But in the meantime, Lovey, thank you from MIJC, from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you so much. Can we please give Peter in a massive round of applause to say huge, huge thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any parting words? Final word? I have no final words. <laughs> <laughs> Let it be known. <laughs> Great. So have a lovely evening, everyone. Happy Easter. Don't forget to tell people about the new position of general manager and about the summer school and the newsletter. Oh my gosh, I'm so chuffed with the newsletter, you guys. But for now, thank you so much, everybody. See you soon and take care. Lots of love. Yeah. Bye. Yeah.